Hey, what's up developers? In this video, you are going to meet Curtis. Curtis has been in the software industry for over 25 years, quarter of a century. He's done interviewing, he's done hiring, he's worked on different teams, and currently he is the vice president of academics over at App Academy. In today's video, we're talking about App Academy Open and why App Academy decided to make the curriculum free. We also talk about who the ideal student is for an in-person coding bootcamp and what people should be looking for when they're looking at a bootcamp. Also be sure to stay tuned because at the end of this video, I'm going to be sharing with you how you can win a three month mentorship plan. App Academy is hooking you guys up. App Academy also sponsored this video. So shout out to them for making this all possible. One of my subscribers, he actually works at Google, um, but he's interested in learning more about web development. Mm -hmm. And he had asked me to review App Academy Open. Um, this was last year, and I have to be totally honest with you, Curtis, I was not looking forward to it because most of the free resources I see are <laughs> not good at all. And yeah. I, I don't want to, and I was like, oh, I just don't want to be a Debbie Downer with the video. I want to, you know, make a positive impression and, and be positive about this video. But then I finally, a year later, checked out App Academy Open, and I was really impressed. And I just, for, for what it is, it is it's such a high quality program and um, the videos, the readings, the assignments, all that stuff, um, awesome. So that was my experience with it. That was my first impression of it. Now this App Academy Open, it's, it's a pretty big opportunity for people because it's free. Um, that said, it's the same curriculum as what you use or almost the same as you used in your in-person bootcamp. Um, so what, what made you guys decide to make this um, an open free curriculum and what are some outcomes you've been seeing? We believe that anybody who wants to learn to code should have the resources available to them. Um, like I said, I was, I was a self-taught programmer. I, I actually taught myself how to program um, while I was in the army in Bosnia, Herzegovina in the mid 90s. So I was actually using printed books that I had with me to be able to learn how to program a computer. Um, that's not very egalitarian, nor is it very equitable. And so there were still, there were still, um, a, you, you, you had to live inside one of the walled gardens to be able to really break into computer science. Mm. Um, but when I got out of the army and I came and I said, I want to be a computer programmer, it turned out I could get hired by anybody without, without a college degree in computer science. And even today, you can still do that, which is, to me is unlike any other profession that we have in the world. Right. If you can demonstrate this skill, people want to hire you. So the question is, how do you acquire that skill? Well, books are so passing. Why, why would we do that now um, when we have the Internet and the World Wide Web to be able to give us all this great content? Now the question is, where do I go to find it? So there's free code camp and Odin project and open MIT course. Where if you want to, you can go to Udemy or any of those sorts of malls of, of education to purchase things. Um, but our CEO, Kush, said uh, it's, it's important that we be able to provide this for anybody who wants that opportunity. And so that's when, when we took our, our curriculum and, and made it free. And the, really, the only thing that isn't there are the tests that we give our students, uh, because there's, we, we don't want to give tests to people who then don't get a grade, because that would be unfair. So for in, in the immersive, you would end up taking a test and getting a grade for it. Um, and then that's really the stuff that we review. So everything else is there. You can, you can do the projects and, you know, you assess yourself on how well they've done based on the requirements that we're giving those projects. Um, the fact that it is a self-contained course that takes you all the way from the database to the front end, and it's built using proper learning techniques of space repetition and interleaving, um, it ends up helping people build durable knowledge in a way that you don't see in either micro learning courses or, or just like smattering of things that are put together. Um, and, and so we actually have real reports of people who have gone through this open free curriculum and taught themselves how to program and then turned around and said, I can now be a full stack Ruby developer. I'm going to go apply for a job 
and they get the job. Mm. And, and we're seeing this across the United States. Now, I, I, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to get a Ruby on Rails job nowadays on the coasts as opposed to like, let's say, the heartland of right. the US. There aren't necessarily a lot of Ruby on Rails jobs in Houston, Texas, where I'm um, but the thing is, is that once you learn full stack development, once you understand how programming languages and frameworks work, and MVC is a pattern for Ruby on Rails, you can then take that experience and use it to pick up something else that may be relevant to your market. So whether or not that's Java or C Sharp or Python or PHP, you can then go and say, I now have experience with Ruby on Rails, and I can translate that and use that as an anchor for all of this new stuff that I'm doing. So that's that's just I, I cannot I can't get over the fact that that we can just teach ourselves a skill and go get a job doing it. You can't yeah. you can't even do that in in plumbing. These types of resource. How do you think these types of resources are going to continue to encourage people as the years go on, um, as these as this career field, the software career field, just keeps exploding? That's a really hard question to answer, um, <laughs> but I think that. I think that you'll see a couple of things. Um, so you will end up seeing a better set of information transfer eventually emerge. So um, when I became, when I transitioned from being a software developer to being an instructor, one of the first questions I asked myself was, how do I write curriculum? I, I just spent 25 years of my life learning how to write software well, and I know the processes, I, I know patterns, I know how to do this. Are there comparable things in instruction technology as well? And the answer is yes, there is. But unfortunately, the majority of the people who produce content for others to consume in our field have very little to no knowledge of how to build good information for people. So in the same way that in the same way that software is or the ability to be able to create software is starting to permeate our entire culture in the US. I think that uh, as we become a learning society, the other side of that is going to have to meet, which is how do we become a teaching society as well. And so more and more people will end up learning things like um, how do I write performance based learning objectives so that when I write or when I create a video, I know what I'm teaching rather than just sitting there and like typing some stuff out that, that I taught or that I figured out myself. That's not, you know, it's not well formed. It's not, um, it, it's not particularly uh, something that will help somebody build durable knowledge. Instead, it's just, um, it's a very short term access gain and then a forget. Right. And we don't want that. We want to be able to like continue to, to make people refresh what it is that they're using. And so uh, I think that that's, um, that's one of the things that we'll see in the future. We see that with, um, if you go to places like Salesforce, for example, Salesforce is an amazing company. They have a great, uh, with force.com, they have a great place to be able to like build Salesforce applications. Uh, being a Salesforce developer is a very lucrative career. You become, mm -hmm. You know, you, you learn some programming and then you can learn how to like use Salesforce and customize it. And that's a, that's a great career for a lot of people. Um, and, and that is, uh, if you go to Salesforce, they have a full curriculum staff now just to be able to help them create really good documentation and learning materials so that people can onboard mm -hmm. to Salesforce more easily. So like I said, as we become a learning society, we also have to become a teaching society. If we don't, then we won't be learning, and um, we all fail. Like you said, as we you know become this this learning society, we need people to teach directly or even indirectly. And this is just if you I mean just looking around at these these platforms are popping up. Uh, we talked about boot camps, physical boot camps earlier. You know, physical brick and mortar places. Um, so yeah, it is expanding, and that's exciting too because it's just more opportunities. Um, and I think when I think of software. I just think the first thing that comes to mind is opportunity because you know if you can if you can dream it you can code it um, and it's just everywhere it's just everywhere and it's it's really exciting. Who is the ideal student for an in-person coding bootcamp? And I'm going to preface this because 
I have a lot of uh, completely self-taught people on my YouTube channel. So that if I were a young person right now and I had the resources available to me, please don't tell my boss this. But if I had the resources available to me right now, I also would think that coding boot camps are a waste of money. I would just teach myself because I know that I can teach myself. But teaching yourself something is actually a really hard process because it requires a lot of self-discipline to be able to consume and stick with something for that long. So you're talking maybe a three to six month investment minimum to be able to become proficient enough by yourself because you're not receiving any feedback by yourself so that you can go and get a job. People who want to go to an in-person boot camp are the people who want to accelerate that learning cycle. So you're paying essentially for, for that acceleration. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing is we're providing you at least daily feedback on how well you are crafting code and how well you are moving from one piece of information to the next on a day-by-day -day basis. And even more importantly, there are people holding you accountable. So in my own professional life, um, when I want to do something, I always try to find an accountability partner because sometimes Face it, I'm, I'm lazy sometimes, and I don't want to do some extra stuff. So if I have an accountability partner, then I know I, I'm being held accountable to them. And so that's something that an in-person boot camp gives you as well. I mean, that's something that you're paying for, somebody to watch out for you, as well as say, hey, how's it going? You know, are, are, you, are you keeping up? If not, how can I help you keep up? Mm -hmm. um, so you, that's, that's really the trade-off there. It's, it's, it's not a waste of money for a lot of people because um, this is the type of learning environment, not only that they're used to, but that they would really, really want very badly um, so that, you know, they can get to the place where they want to go with some help. But I will admit, though, that learning code by myself or just on a Slack channel would seem a little, a little isolated. Right. Um, and so that's always that start too. You you end up getting collegiality and collaboration in an in-person boot camp that you just don't get doing it by yourself and then going to uh, you know a meetup once a week uh, to talk about it. And you still get I mean there's community but it's not as close of community. You don't get the common struggle. What should people be looking for when they know they want to go to boot camp but just don't know which one to pick? So I'd like to, I'd like to throw in a little plug if that's okay. Uh, we just launched a new product. Uh, we just launched a new course. Our online course is now full stack JavaScript and Python. So um, to, I, I think in one of your videos you said, uh, when you were, I think in your video, when you were reviewing all the stuff, you said Ruby on Rails, if you're not inside necessarily a major tech hub, you're not gonna, you know, Ruby on Rails jobs aren't necessarily as easy to find as they used to. While our in-person classes in New York and San Francisco continue to be Ruby on Rails because those markets really do support them, our online one is now JavaScript and Python, which is which are two languages that you can find them being used all across not only the U.S. but the world. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're interested in web development, you've got those tools. If you're interested in perhaps transitioning into something like data science, you know Python so that you can use that and apply that. So that's really the question, in my opinion. If I were to invest money in a coding bootcamp, the first thing I would do is I would go on some, on some sort of job site or go to Stack Overflow Jobs, and I would look to see what kind of jobs are there available in the area that I live, because it's always gonna be easier for you to find a job um, that's not remote. And unfortunately, the, the idea of a remote workforce is still not fully realized. Um, but if you can do that, right, if, 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 you, if you really push yourself and stick to only remote job searches, then you can be a little more choosy in terms of the link, excuse me, the languages or the, uh, the, the tech stacks that, that, that you want to learn. But really, look, look at the area. So again, for example, I live in, I live in Houston, Texas, and the, the languages there, the tech stacks there are Java and C Sharp. That's, that's just it. So those are enterprise languages, and that's an enterprise software type. Um, you, 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 you will find those sorts of languages all over the place. And so it, let's say you live in Minneapolis and where, where C Sharp turns out it's a really huge thing there. It's a, it's a very Microsoft town. Um, you would want to be able to learn something that teaches you C Sharp. And so um, you, 
that there are coding boot camps that are not nationally recognized because they only have very they have one or two campuses and they're you know like in a town or a regional boot camp. So you would end up going there and you you would uh, you would use their curriculum because normally those match up with the the employers of the area. All right, developers, here's what's up. If you want to win a three month mentorship plan to App Academy Open, here's what you have to do. Number one, be subscribed to this channel. Number two, leave a comment telling me that you're interested in this mentorship plan. And what this does is that it gives you daily access to the App Academy instructors through a Slack channel. They're going to be helping you out to answer technical questions, provide guidance as you go through App Academy Open. I will be randomly selecting a winner, so if you get a YouTube notification, be sure to read it because you may have just won the prize.